This is Joe Wong. Welcome to the Trap Set. Today's guest is Alan Braufman, a saxophonist and composer who first emerged during New York's loft jazz movement of the 1970s. Rothman's music received renewed attention in 2018, which marked the reissue of his 1975 debut, Valley of Search. His latest album, The Fire Still Burns, was released last year. Alan spoke to me in August from his home in Salt Lake City. Hello, is this Joe? Yeah. Hey, it's Alan. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Pretty good. Where are you? Uh, I'm in Salt Lake right now <laughs> in Utah. Nice. Pretty weird. <laughs> Where are you? I'm in uh, Pasadena, California. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, thank you for doing this. Nabil's a good friend, and I- I'm a fan of your music. Uh, in- and actually, um, you know, I was familiar with it before Nabil... Uh, told me that you were related. <laughs> oh, that's cool. You grew up on Long Island? Yeah, I was born in Brooklyn, grew up on Long Island, um, about a uh, half hour, 30, 40 minutes out of the city near Jones Beach. Oh, nice. What what town were you in? I was in Wantaw. Oh, okay. And and then, um, you know, I've met your sister. Is she younger or older? She's two years older. Okay, so it was just the two of you? Yeah. And um, what kind of music was on in the house when you were growing up? Jazz. Uh, that's what got me into the music. Uh, my, my mom, particularly, she had like a, she had kind of impeccable tastes at the time. You know, she, what was going on in the house was uh, it was Coltrane and Mingus and uh, the Modern Jazz Quartet and Eric Dolphy and et cetera. You know, and uh, that's the music I grew up listening to. Wow. Uh, would your mom take you to concerts so that you could see those artists? Yeah, she took me to some. My dad took me to a few also. Um, my earliest, we'll talk about early memories. Uh, the earliest memory of a concert I went to is um, my mom took me to see Duke Ellington's orchestra at the, it's called the Westbury Music Fair. Um, they had like, um, it was a tent where they, they had shows and this and that. And once in a while they had concerts there too. So she took me to Duke Ellington and the MJQ, Mom and Jazz Quartet. And those are very clear in my mind. Do you remember how it felt when you saw that music live? Yeah, it was amazing. You know, I was, it wasn't like, well, uh, she likes it. It's okay. I mean, I was a big fan, you know, and uh, until it came time that I was pushing her, hey, why don't you get this record? And I read about this one and we don't have that yet. Get this one. (laughs) Wow. You know, you hear about a generational divide, especially with your generation, like baby boomers Mm -hmm. breaking away from their parents' taste, but it sounds like, you know, this was something that you shared. Yeah, well, I had no, you know, no need to break away from that. (laughs) I was just playing some good stuff. When did it feel like music was something you could participate in rather than just consume and enjoy? Actually, pretty early. I I remember, um, you know, she, um, I remember she brought this um, Out There by Eric Dolphy, that that album. I was probably, I don't know, maybe 12, something like that. Um, And I was, I'd been playing clarinet since I was eight. But uh, I, I remember um, <laughs> calling my mom in. I listened to it and said, hey, uh, he sounds like that. Is this close? And I played do some noodling around on the clarinet, thinking I was improvising and everything. And she'd give me encouragement and say, yeah, that, keep trying. That, that's, that's good. You'll sound like him someday. You know, I never, never believed I would sound like him, and I haven't sounded like him. But it was nice to hear that. <laughs> um, what did your parents do? Um, my dad was a lawyer. Uh, and my mom just hung out at home. So you took clarinet lessons in school, or did, were you taking them privately? Uh, I took them in school. Yeah, I was um, <clears throat> at the time of the, where I went. Um, they had a very good music program and a good music teacher who kind of inspired me and um, taught me clarinet pretty well. Um, you know, I became a, a decent clarinet player. I was first chair all through you know junior high and high school, but. Um, 
uh, you know, once I started saxophone when I was 13, uh, the clarinet was kind of in the rear view mirror. What was your first sax? An alto? An alto, yeah. As a matter of fact, um, that's an interesting question because um, uh, I hadn't, you know, I, I had access to an alto, so um, I had an alto. And um, all the musicians I would listen to later on, you know, maybe a little older, older like around 15 or something, um, all the, my favorite musicians were all tenor players. And I figured, well, I've got an alto now. I don't have a tenor, but as soon as I get a tenor, that's going to be the one. Um, and uh, uh, I was able to get a tenor from the, to take home from the school for uh, a summer. And I was all excited. I'm going to play tenor now. And I played it, and I said, oh, I don't like it as much as the alto. I, I got to hear things in the higher range. And so my all through my life, I've sort of like gravitated to the alto, sort of being influenced on alto by tenor players. Who were your main influences at the time when you wanted to play tenor? Well, I wouldn't say influence. I wasn't old enough to have influences yet, I guess. Uh, my favorites, yeah. It was, um, you know, obviously, the you know, the usual, you know, Coltrane and Albert Eiler, Archie Shep. You know, the gold, they had a lot of music in the house, so I could listen, I would listen to the old stuff, too. You know, I had Coleman Hawkins records in the house and, you know, Sonny Rollins, you know. Did you get to see... Albert Eiler live? Yeah, mm -hmm. I did. Yeah, I, I, I was able to see. Um, there was a series of um, concerts in 1966 at the, the Village Theater, which, uh, which eventually became um, the Fillmore East. And it was like, um, I think they're like two weeks apart from each other. And they had, you know, it's a big theater that seat about 3,000 people. Uh, the first one was, I don't know, the first or second or third, I don't remember which was first, but anyway, one of the concerts that was, um, well, had started with, uh, Marion Brown and Ram Blake, Gene Lee duo, and then Coltrane played after them. Mm. And then another one was, uh, uh, Archie Shep and, uh, Albert Eiler opposite each other. Well, I had a, I had this record that Albert Eiler made, I think at the Village Gate mm -hmm. when I was about 15. And not many of my friends were into that music. I mean, Right. Were other kids involved in this w that you were friends with, or was this kind of your own thing at the time? This is my own thing. It was like I would love to have some people involved with me in it, but um, that's not what what it was. So, <laughs> and you know, it's, it's um, I. It wasn't like I was. I was certainly not a snob. I liked the pop music too. The, the pop music at that time was pretty interesting. You know, uh, you know, in the the mid to late sixties, there was a lot of interesting stuff happening with you know, Jimi Hendrix and the Birds, and like, you can go on and on. But it, it was a good time for that too. When did playing music become kind of central to your identity rather than just a hobby? Um, believe it or not, it sounds funny now, but um, I was actually a pretty good baseball player, and I wanted to be a baseball player. You know, I was you know thirteen, fourteen, and you know, a long way from um, doing anything baseball. But you know, I played was good. You know. On, on Little League and all that. And I had this music thing interest too. And then one day I, I, I just remember um, deciding, I said, well, the music is going to be it. It's not going to be the baseball. And I, I don't think I played much baseball after that. I just started um, focusing on the music. Was there any pressure uh, from your family to go into something more stable? Like your father was a lawyer. I mean, was the, were they thinking of this as your you know, potential career or were they just indulging a hobby? I don't think they thought either way. They were just like, um, figured that they were supporting my interest and they would, um, let's see where it took me. So there weren't any kind of expectations put on you. They were just really letting you find your own way. Yeah. Yeah. My parents are pretty cool in that respect. What was the impetus to go to Berkeley? Well, at the time, Berkeley is about the only, um, game in town or in, in the country, <laughs> uh, for a jazz school. Um, there, I guess it, around the time that there's a few others were opening like North Texas and um, there wasn't many jazz programs at school. And at the time, Berkeley was really cheap. So, um, do you remember how much it cost? Yeah, I do. It was, it was $500 a semester. So it was 1000 a year. <laughs> <laughs> and I took out a student loan, you know, for $4,000 that paid for college. And I got that paid off in a few years after I was done. And, um, uh, I had to. Um, so you actually were one of the few that graduated. I am. I didn't go straight. You know, I took uh, semesters off, and then would make them up like take a winter off and 
come back to New York and make up the time over the summer. So I, you know, I did four years there over actual three year. I mean, there was a four year period, but I was there about three years of it. I went there for a couple of years too. And I, I uh, found it, it was strange to me to um, study music in an academic setting. Somehow I felt like those two endeavors were Mm -hmm. I agree uh, with you. <laughs> at odds with one another, in a sense. Um, so, wh what was your experience? I, I had a I had a good good experience in Boston. Um, my experience at Berkeley was that um, it, I would had a, uh, it would have been more fruitful if I had gone a few year, years later. Because when I went, you know, up there when I was eighteen, all I wanted to do was play. I just wanted to practice and play. I didn't. So I didn't take advantage of the, the the arranging courses, the writing courses that they had, the composition courses. It's a lot of stuff that I, that I just didn't take advantage of because I I just wanted to play. Um, and you don't need to go to school to play. I didn't have to be at Berkeley, um, but um, it was the Vietnam War. It was kept me out of the draft. I hate to say it, but you know. did you meet anybody uh, at Berkeley that became consequential in your journey as a musician? At Berkeley, no, I don't think I really did at Berkeley, but I met several people in Boston who weren't going to Berkeley, who who were very instrumental. Yeah, yeah. What does that tell you about the school? <laughs> right. Well, I don't, know. I don't put Berkeley down. Berkeley's no. okay, you know. But um, you know, it's like I said, you know, I wasn't in in the place where I would take advantage of really what they had to offer. You know, you don't need to go to school to sit in the practice room, you know, five six hours a day and play. So then once you graduated, what was your next step? Well, the timing was perfect because I've been uh, playing with Cooper Moore in, uh, in, uh, in Boston. He was there at the time. And he was Gene Ashton at the time, it right? He was Gene Ashton at the time, yeah. And, um, you know, he would have a lot of sessions at his house and um, you know, some, a few gigs here and there and everything. But it was mainly like um, it wasn't about gigging at that time. It was just there was music being made at the, these sessions. It was like amazing. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that was, that was one. And, um, uh, uh, David, David Ware was, went to Berkeley at the time. Um, and, um, uh, so when we, um, moved back to New York, um, well, Cooper Moore got the building at 501 Canal street um, that we all moved into. Uh, it was a, a, a five, five story building on canal all the way over on the west side by the Hudson River. And um, it was uh, very cheap. We can, um, didn't have to work too much to afford to live in those days there. Do you remember so how I much had, it cost? Yeah, it was $140 a floor. And I shared, this, <laughs> I shared the second floor. It was an entire floor, too. It wasn't like cramped. It wasn't a studio apartment. I shared the, the second floor with David Ware uh, for three years of 73 to 76 until David moved out. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, it was always like the, the, the thing about, the, in my mind, I knew I was done with Boston, I'm going back to New York, and where am I going to live? You know, that's always a problem, you know, uh, when you're co <laughs> coming to New York, because it's a hard place, to, even those days, it was a hard place to, um, to, find, to find a place. And even though comparative to now, it was very, rents in the city were very cheap. It still felt expensive, you know, but right. Canal Street, that was a different story. So I was paying $70 a month sharing it with David and Cooper was on the, the third floor and there was a bass player who um, moved down there with us from Boston. Uh, actually, he was from San Francisco, but he was in Boston uh, named Chris Amberger. So he had the fourth floor and uh, the fifth floor seemed the drummers gravitated to it. So Jimmy Hops was up there for a while mm. and then um, when Jimmy moved out, uh, Tom Bruno moved in. Uh, who's um, and we used to that the um, the ground floor was a storefront, so we you know just a big open space. So we were um, we were able to put on concerts there um, every weekend, and also you could practice down there twenty four seven. Didn't matter. So musician building was great. Were you able to make rent by just putting on the concerts? Not really. Not not be, you know because uh, you couldn't charge too much and. Uh, they were pretty well attended, but there's you know four or five music musicians to pay. Not, but um, I was able to <laughs> I was able to make rent. But David um, got a, a job um, for two and a half hours a day at lunchtime at this deli down near Wall near Wall Street. So 
he would just deliver uh, lunches to Wall Street executives and for two and a half hours. And he got me on that job too. So we just walked down from Canal Street and uh, walk all day, delivering lunches, walk back. We were in, I guess, pretty good shape. But um, that was that was that was enough. It's funny that was enough. I didn't need. That was the, the most solvent I've ever been, believe it or not, because the formula is supposed to be um, rent us a quarter of your income. And I was making about $70 a week, and I was paying 70 bucks a month rent. So I was doing better then than now. <laughs> well, I think a lot about how in large cities from about that time to now, how the cost of living has far outpaced you know, the median income and, and yeah. whether that's sustainable and what's going to happen. <laughs> Especially now, you know, with the pandemic, I wonder yeah. what's going to happen with rents in New York with, um, you know, people are not going to be able to pay them. Well, what I've heard is that there's lots of exorbitantly wealthy people that just park their money in real estate in the big cities. So mm. that kind of creates a, a false sense of scarcity. Yeah. Or an yeah, artificial false. sense of scarcity. But yep. um, so, tell me about your neighborhood at the time. I mean, this is Soho. Uh, yeah, well, it's actually. Um, or is it? What is it? Technically, if it, if it had been named yet, it would have been Tribeca. So these were old factories. Yeah. And what was the what was the scene like in the neighborhood? Was it? Did it feel safe? Was it crazy? Well, New York was crazy in, in the seventies. Um, I think about like Scorsese movies when I right. think of New York mean in the streets. 70s. Mean streets. <laughs> yeah. Was that relatively accurate? Yeah, I think so. Um, from what I read, you know, that was his experience, I guess, growing up. He made that movie about just putting what he saw growing up in, into a movie. But um, it, that's a whole different scene than, you know, the jazz scene. But um, yeah, the neighborhood was great. New York, I loved it. I, lo I like New York better then than I do now, although I still like it. But um, now it's, you know, it's quite a corporate city now. But yeah, it was it was good. The neighborhood was was wonderful because um, nobody was there. It was um, just kind of vacant. Uh, you'd have to walk like fifteen blocks to go to a supermarket to find society. But it was great. You walk across town, you'd be in Chinatown or Little Italy, and you know it was really wonderful. I loved it. So, did you feel at the time like life was good? You know, you you were solvent, as you said. <laughs> You're playing a lot of music. You don't have to work a day job that often, you know, how, how did your, how did you feel? And like, did you, what were your hopes at the time? It was very good. I was young. So I had a ton of energy. So although it was good, it wasn't easy, you know, like even Canal Street, like a few little things about the, the building that didn't, um, one of the reasons why it was so cheap, uh, the building didn't have any central heating. You could just heat up with, you know, electric heaters by the, each room. But the, um, that would get, quite costly and be a fire hazard if you like you know left it on when you're when you're outside or at night when you go to sleep and on those very cold winter days when it get down near zero and be like um, right near the hudson river where it'd be you know 10 degrees colder than the rest of the city if um you go to sleep at night without tur without turning the heat on which you would do if you had a bottle of water or juice or something if you left it out of the refrigerator it would freeze but it'd be okay in the refrigerator <laughs> so it was a cold it was cold and in uh 1975 you released your first uh solo album valley of search right what do you remember about writing and recording that you know we were playing um quite a bit quite often at, at canal street and so it was a good it was almost like um those weekly concerts were a workshop for to work on your music and you can, you write something you can perform it immediately so what valley of search basically was was um a typical set that we would do you know in a concert at canal street you know um so when um bob cummins who's um was the founder of the label indian navigation company that um you know was released on uh he just uh, when he was got interested in recording he came to a concert down there and said let's just record it in the in the you know, at Canal Street in the in the in the um, performance space. So he brought his recording equipment over, and we did we did it in one take for each um, side, and there it was. And he was a he was a lawyer, right, Bob? Yeah, he was. He was. And so this was the label was kind of like his passion project. 
Exactly. Yeah. I I don't know what kind of law he did. I forget. I knew at the time, but um, but yeah, this um, that's what he did for money, and that's what he did for what he loved. Did it feel like a landmark in your life at the time to create a record, or was it just kind of like a document of what was happening, and you moved on? I think it was more. It was more the second. You know, it's almost like. I didn't appreciate at the time what we had done, you know, I kind of forgot about it. Okay. It's out there. What am I going to do now? Which I don't know if that's good or bad, but, um, you know, retrospect, I should have um, doubled down and, you know, played, you know, changed things, you know, tried to play more places and this and that and support the record, but whatever. I was 24 years old. So what do you know? Would you say that you were an ambitious person as far as, you know, trying to build a career, like the, the things that are not directly related to the music? Um, I, things not directly related to the music, I, I lack ambition with, which is to my detriment. <laughs> I'm ambitious with the music, but the business side or pushing, promoting myself, any of that stuff, I'm, uh, I am not ambitious. Yeah, I mean, lots of people aren't. It's really uncomfortable to push yourself, right? Right, <laughs> When you say you're ambitious with the music, how does that manifest, and how has it changed over time? Like, um, how, do you, how do you know when, you know, you're happy with what you're doing, or are you ever happy with what you're doing? Or is there, mm -hmm. you know, I hear about people like Coltrane practicing 24-7 and practicing the second they get off stage. I mean, do you have that same quality? I wish I had that quality as much as he did. Um, I've, I have it, but on a much lesser level, lower level. You know, I practice a lot, but, you know, I've never done a 12-hour day practicing, which was, you know, a commonplace day for, for train, you know? Yeah. So when you practice, uh, are you structured with, like, what you're hoping to accomplish, or do you just play? Uh, it depends. You know, one day it'll be something I'm trying to accomplish, and another day it'll just just play. And when you're just playing, things that you want to work on sort of pop up spontaneously. And you, you know, it's kind of stream of consciousness. You're just playing, and then say, "Well, that was cool. Let me work on that." And it kind of leads itself. And so, how long were you at the building on Canal Street? I was there actually for ten years, although it was only for um, for the f first three years of. Uh, that um, it was musically, uh, you know, in 76, um, Cooper Moore moved out and uh, David moved out, um, David Ware. And um, some non-musicians moved into the building and they were all cool. It was still a nice place to be, but it wasn't so much of a music building anymore. And what was going on in your life and career, you know, as in the later years at the uh, place on Canal Street? Well, in... Uh, no, I would. I would still, um, you know, be play with people, different people. Um, in '77, I um, started playing with Carla Blay and her band. That um, she would tour two or three times a year, and um, I did that for around three years, which is a wonderful experience. Um, and um, once I got into the '80s, I kind of started going a different direction musically, and. It was to a slightly more commercial, uh, you know, approach. I liked what I did. I didn't necessarily do it because it was more commercial, but uh, I kind of—that's where my, you know, 
what I heard at the moment. So, and that's when you kind of changed your name, your professional name. <laughs> I I did. It's kind of a an accident, almost how that happened, but um, I did wind up getting changed. <laughs> what happened? Oh, uh, okay. Um, it's a, it's in the mid eighties now, and I had um, produced an album um, and pay for it myself. You know, uh, you know, uh, you know, got the finished product, and then was sending around to companies. And, you know, the usual thing, you send it out to the company and a few weeks later, um, you call up and follow through and see if it's, if anybody's listened to it and, you know, whatever. And what would happen was, um, I would, um, the receptionist would answer and I'd say, hi, uh, this is Alan Brofman. And invariably they'd say, Alan who? Uh, Alan Brofman. Uh, Alan Brosman? No, that's an F, not an S. And, it would take me five minutes to, to get through the introduction of my name. And so I said, okay, the next time I, I, I send it out, I'm just going to see what happens. You know, I send it out as Alan, Alan Michael. Michael's my middle name. So I sent it out as Alan Michael to Passport Records, and they liked it, and they signed it. And I said, no, I could have told them, well, it's, it's really Alan Brofman. But I said, well, maybe it's a sign, you know. I'll go with that for a while and see. And all that was fine. Uh, it was Alan Michael until uh, 2018 when um, uh, Value Search got reissued. And, of course, they're not going to reissue that as Alan Michael. So um, all of a sudden, there's was like, well, who am I? Am I going to be Alan Michael or Alan Brofman? I decided to go back to Alan Brofman at that point. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there a difference in the, the person? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the, uh, the album was reissued by my friend and your nephew, Nabil Ayers. Um, yeah. And Nabil has been on this show a couple of years ago. Mm. Um, he's a drummer and he currently yeah. manages a record label and um, or a couple record labels actually. Um, but, uh, you know, he, he spoke a little bit about your relationship and, and, you know, he saw you as somewhat of a surrogate father figure. Um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how, you and Nabil's relationship uh, developed over the years? Well, you know, my sister was a single parent, and so um, I was around, and I absolutely adored him. <laughs> he was like who he is today. He, he was born that. You know, he was like totally wonderful from the first day. And uh, anyway, you know, I helped I raise him, basically, as, as a, more like a father than an uncle. And um, it's always, uh, our relationship is... Uh, like that to, to this day it's you know it's really wonderful and it's so good to see how he's turned out and how successful he's been and um yeah how did you get involved with the psychedelic furs uh the psychedelic furs well that's an interesting story um it was in 1982 and i was still on canal street and um very good friend and no longer with us, Gary Window, tenor player from England. He was a tenor player in Carla Blaze Band, so we got to be very good friends, roommates on the road. And um, so I hadn't talked to him in a while, but um, one day I get a call. Hey, it's Gary. Um, do you want to go out and tour with the Psychedelic Furs for a little bit? And I said, who are they? Because <laughs> um, this is, I think, the first American tour. They, they were... Um, supporting the first album that weren't really that well known um and i said well yeah whatever that's that's cool it sounds fun when's it what are the dates when's the tour and he says oh they'll, they'll pick you t up tonight in front of your house at eight o'clock <laughs> <laughs> had they just fired somebody no it would have been gary who they fired no oh. that's what's happened because <laughs> he was a saxophone, their saxophone yeah. player but um uh what happened was uh he was uh he was from england he was over here and he overstayed his visa over here, and the tour was going up to Canada. So if he left the country, he wasn't, probably wasn't going to get it back in. So he asked me to, to do There wasn't too many of them, just a few dates up in Toronto or something, uh, and up in Buffalo, New York. Yeah, so I went up. Uh, the, the big tour bus shows up at Canal Street that night, and um, I spent the, the night. They had a cassette to listen to the, the tunes, so I had to learn them, you know, it wasn't complicated, <laughs> but easy to learn stuff. But I had to learn the, the set overnight, just listen to the, to the to the tape. And the um, funny thing was when I, um, you know, it was the first two that weren't well known amongst, you know, like 
um, the general public, I guess, but they had, a, a, I guess, a, a, some fans, a lot of fans. So, um, I remember the, the, um, bus ride over to the, um, to the, uh, to the sound check. And like, um, I'm still listening to the tape because I say, oh, I make sure that I got this. So my eyes are closed and feel the, feel the bus stop and get off the bus. And there's like thousands of <laughs> screaming fans. And I said, oh, this is different than I thought it was going to be. Okay, this could be fun. <laughs> and you mentioned that you you were, you know, you have pretty wide spanning taste. So it didn't feel like a weird, you know, compromise to take a gig like that. No, not at all. Not at all. I actually enjoyed the music. I, I still like the music. Not only that, but um, on my album that I did at, that was released as Alan Michael on Passport Records. The name of the album is called Lost in Asia. Um, uh, I recorded Sister Europe, one of the tunes. Um, that was like uh, was two, my originals, but I had two covers. Said, uh, I Love You, Love You Porky by Gershwin mm-hmm. and Sister Europe by the Psychedelic Furs. And that album also has Bill Frizzell on it, Correct. Yeah, he's he's playing on that tune on Sister Europe, just that one. Yeah. So, what was the impetus to move out of the loft finally after ten years? There's a lot of things. Kind of felt like they were closing in. Um, there was um, trouble with the landlord. It looked like the lease that the um, well, it, it, it was actually some litigation in court, which was which was won by us actually. But you know, the landlord was wanted to do other things with the building. He was trying to get us out. And I knew it was going to be, it was the handwriting was on the wall. And a few years later, you know, it did, you know, it, it was terminated. But so I wanted to get out uh, uh, ahead of the game, I guess. I've been there 10 years and maybe I was needing a little bit of heat. And also um, you know, my girlfriend at the time was now my wife, but, um, you know, she wasn't too fond of the no heat thing. <laughs> <laughs> so you stayed in New York. Oh yeah, stayed another ten years. Um, moved just up to Twenty Sixth Street in Chelsea. Oh okay, and then and then did you move to Utah after that? Yeah. And your yeah. your sister was working at Amex in in Salt Lake at the time, right? Yeah, she. Had, it's funny how that worked out because she had moved here and with Nabil, and um, and one of the reasons I picked went well. Shannon, my wife, wanted to get out of New York at the time. We had two kids already. And um, so I said, I'll cut, try anything. So she said, let's, let's, um, let's go to Salt Lake because your sister's there. It's an easy place, easier place to live. The rents are cheap. It's always true. But by the time we actually moved here, my sister had moved to Berkeley, California and got married. So <laughs> she wasn't here. Yeah, Salt Lake is a very interesting place. And, and culturally, it seems so different from New York. Um, yeah. Was it yep. a shock to move there at first? Were there people to play with? Yeah, there are people to play with. Not, not you know, not as many, of course. But there's just a handful of very good musicians here, and um, it's kind of uh, it's not, um, you know, th- th- there are good good musicians to play with. Not necessarily for the the music that I would most like to play, but they're good musicians, and you can play with them. <laughs> Yeah, you must like it to a certain extent, otherwise you wouldn't have stayed for so long. Well, that's true, but it's also, the thing is that when when you leave New York City, um, unless you have a lot of money, it's a tough place to go back to. If you have a family apartment that's been rent-controlled for 50 years, that's one thing. Yeah. Right. And I, and I have, um, you know, I, I stay with my sister when I go back there in Brooklyn, and I can stay with her, you know, indefinitely, but I, I don't think she'd have me moving in. <laughs> <laughs> Did having kids change your relationship with music in any way? I don't think so. I mean, it made it harder because it's not as easy to just go, you feel like practicing, you just go do it. You know, um, there's, <laughs> kids have a way of um, changing those kind of plans. But um, I would you know, I kept it f- foremost in my mind still. And um, I, I, don't, I, I did that record, you know, the, uh, Lost in Asia, which I, you know, I actually feel very good about still. Do you generally feel good about how you play? Like, what's your inner monologue like? Uh, my inner monologue is, I shouldn't even tell you. <laughs> it's terrible. Well, now I definitely want to know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's nothing, no, nothing that weird or anything. It's just like, I think I suck. Mm-hmm. And once in a while, I think I do something okay. 
<laughs> I mean, that's pretty relatable, I think. Yeah, it's, um, you know, some days, you know, I'd say, well, I played okay today. But most of the time, you know, like, um, I come home and say, okay, that was whatever it was. I want to forget about it and whatever, you know, wait till next time, do better. Yeah. It's kind of the same when I write because I write, um, I write a lot, but my, I have a kind of very, um, uh, unforgiving editing process and most, most of the stuff I write goes in the trash. Mm -hmm. But what stays, I think, is good sometimes. <laughs> so. How often do you f experience joy when you're creating music? Well, writing is a different kind of joy. It's kind of, you, f you get something that you write that you feel good with. I think that that's very satisfying, you know, to, to hear something you wrote, played, and, and have it work. Um, but, uh, the, you know, but that's all, you know, the, the planning stages and you, you know, you sit down and pl you, I don't like this. No, this won't be better. The real joy is when you play it and it's spontaneous and, you know, there's definitely that's where the joy is can you feel that on a visceral level even though your mind is telling you that you suck most of the time <laughs> well when i'm playing i'm not con constantly thinking i suck you know that's more like afterwards <laughs> say well so you're able to kind of like let go of that critical mind while you're in the moment playing oh yeah yeah i think if you couldn't you couldn't um it'd be hopeless to create something that 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 was that was actually good. You're thinking about something else, you know. Yeah. Does that ever happen to you, though? Like, do you ever? Does the that that like editor mind or drill sergeant inner drill sergeant ever kind of creep into when you're playing a gig? Um, it will happen if I if it's a gig that I have not been able to find a good read for. Because <laughs> playing <laughs> is playing is really hard then, and I actually will suck. <laughs> Let's talk about your new album which is coming uh, out yeah. later this month, The Fire Still Burns. Yeah, August 28th. What, tell me about this, you know, tell me about why you chose to make it and, and if there's a concept behind it or, you know, what was the approach? I had a few years, um, several years in Salt Lake where I was working as a musician regularly, um, but, you know, nothing was uh, very satisfying, you know. I would be, I wouldn't. I was able to make enough money. I don't have to do anything else. But um, you know, the kind of gigs, you know, weddings, and this and that. Um, I'm not dissing that. You know, that's okay. You know, like, and I'm thankful I had them. Um, but um, I can't say that I had much uh, joy playing them. But um, something kind of around uh, five years ago. Uh, I don't know what happened. I just started having ideas again, and uh, writing again, and practicing a lot more. And um, then in 2018, when uh, Valley Research was, was uh, reissued, we went back to New York City and we played a few concerts to, uh, you know, to celebrate the reissue. And um, it was encouraging because it was very well received. Both, uh, both concerts were sold out and a um, good response from the audience. So Nabil, after that, he said, hey, you know, why do you want to do a new album? And I said, well, yeah, sure. I did new about new album, but um, uh, he said, "How's it going to happen?" <laughs> he said, "Well, I'll produce it." So it's it's kind of interesting because once he said that, and there was actually um, a, a tangible thing, a possibility of actually doing it. Um, like I said, you know, when I write, I have you know this editing thing. You know, I just throw out a ton of ton of tunes, or I have a forty bar tune that winds up being an 18 bar tune at the end um i'm kind of the less just just make every note count you know don't have an extra note in there that's my philosophy but um when he uh you know right after that possibility came uh arose to actually record a new album i got uh for the next few months i just got all these ideas it felt like i wasn't editing anything the album the tunes were appearing whole you know like home it's a one of the tunes on the album that's already been released like as a single uh i was just noodling at the piano and uh and 20 minutes later the tune was written and i didn't edit it at all it came out as it was um and it, it was like that for all eight tunes pretty much so i don't know what that was but i have a theory that you know even when you throw something out like you normally do that is leading you on the path to 
those kind of moments where you get lucky and, and things start coming. Yeah, it, it, as long as you're working at the craft, you know, things are going to come, you know. But nothing ever came this easy. So were you skeptical of it? <laughs> no, I wasn't, actually. I, I was, <clears throat> it was like, almost like um, maybe a little too secure with everything because it's a week and a half before, you know, the uh, we came in the last, um, be a year ago last September. Um a week and a half before, we had a couple of concerts in New York, and then we're uh, going to in to record the album. So the, the concerts are sort of like rehearsal. Um, so a week before that, I still had two tunes that um, I had ideas for, but I hadn't um, really worked on them yet um, too much. And I had no doubt. I said, it's a week and a half. Oh, something, will, something will get on. Something will come to me. And one day, uh, it did. And they were done. So... It was, uh, I, 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 you know, it's kind of like I found these tunes, then I, then I wrote them. What was it like having Nabil produce you? Oh, well, great, because he was the, the ideal producer. A, I trust his opinions completely, and B, he let me do what I want. <laughs> what do you want to do next? I guess all, all plans are off um, until we see what's... Yeah. So we, um, the pandemic thing is over because, um, yeah, what I want to do next is play, play this music live, but mm -hmm. they got to wait a little bit for that. What do you think about the most throughout the day? Like, do you find yourself noticing recurring thoughts? I, I have recurring thoughts, mostly about music. You know, it's just like um, a lot of the, some of the ways that tunes come to me is uh, I'll hum something, and you know, a lot of people will go and write it down if they like it, you know, to, um, and I always thought, well, if if I don't write it down, if if it comes back to me tomorrow, then it's good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you know, half the day is spent just like music going through my head. If I'm not practicing, I'm humming it to myself or whatever. It's recurring thoughts. So, I mean, recurring thoughts about the the horrible political situation we have. You can't get away from that in this country yeah. right now. Um, uh, it's nice to have the music in my head more than that, but you got to go there, you know? If you could get into a time machine and go meet up with 18-year-old Alan, is there anything that you would want to ask or tell him? Hmm. Yeah, I would tell him, Take those writing classes at Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe wait a couple years before you go. Right, and wait a couple years and spend those couple, those couple years that you're waiting. That's when you practice all day long and you're not paying a school, you know, to, to, uh, while you're doing it. So your new album, The Fire Still Burns, features your old pal Cooper Moore. It features James Brandon Lewis on uh, tenor and Ken Villiano on bass. Andrew Drury on drums, and uh, Michael Wimberly on percussion. Michael's only on two, two tunes, but yes, he's Michael's on percussion. How did you choose those folks? Well, obviously, Cooper Moore, we've been playing it together, you know, 50 years. Um, you know, when I, when, when I write something um, I ask that I know he's going to be playing with, like the stuff on this album, um, it's almost as if... Um, I feel secure in what that I'm not going to have to tell Cooper Moore anything. This is the chord. This is what this is what the tune is. You do it, whatever you do is going to be better than anything I could tell you to do. So I never have to worry about Cooper Moore. <laughs> and um, uh, the Cooper Moore found uh, recommended uh, when we did the, the concert in uh, 2018 in New York um, for Valley of Search. Uh, Cooper Moore recommended uh, Ken Filiano on bass and Andrew Drury on drums and. Um, and yeah, so happy with that uh, combination because uh, they're wonderful. And not only that, but everybody in the band is wonderful to hang out with, not just to not just to play, you know. And uh, James Brandon Lewis, um, uh, I knew James. I met him first when uh, I played with Cooper Moore at the Vision Festival in 2016. And James was was just hanging out there, you know, uh, at the. Um, you know, in the musician's room. So we had to talk, and, um, and when I got back to, from New York, um, to, at, back to Salt Lake, I, I checked out some of um, Brandon's albums. 
So, wow, it's beautiful stuff. Um, so when it came time to do those concerts, um, I didn't, you know, the Valley of Search doesn't have a tenor player, just myself on alto. So I didn't need a saxophone player or another horn at all, but I wanted to work with James. So I asked him to do it, and um, uh, it, it worked very well. So when it came time to do the um, the new album, I said, well, that band worked. Let's do the same the same band. Well, Alan Brofman, Alan Michael Brofman, I should say, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. The Trap Set is produced by me, Joe Wong, along with Chris Karwowski, who also edits the program. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Trap Set. And visit our website, thetrapset.net, to subscribe to our show for free. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please donate to our show. If you can't afford to donate, please tell a friend and give us a good rating on iTunes. Send your feedback and guest requests to thetrapset at gmail.com. <laughs>